way because because I I live in in Wimbledon, so I pass you on the way to Richmond Park sometimes. So I I think we're at a very interesting area. Our time in relation to psychosis, when we've learned so much uh, uh, about psychosis and schizophrenia. I mean, when I started, we talked mostly about schizophrenia and it, people would say that it was a, a, an enigma, a total mystery. We didn't know anything about the causal factors. But now I think we know a great deal about the causal, the, 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 the causal factors. So, uh, oops, let's see how, oh, there we go. I've, I've uh, given uh, lectures from uh, supported by various drug companies. I never actually talk about uh, their drug but uh, sometimes they want people to uh, uh, to to, uh, to give a general talk, which I'm always happy to do. Uh, the biology of psychosis is quite simple. It is D and G, and uh, 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 at least half of the audience will know what D and G stand for. It's uh, Dolce and Gabbana, who of course are famous Sicilian. I, I fashion designers. Actually, I've just walked down Bond Street uh, this morning, and uh, there are, they, they, I don't know if you know, but the, the, the new color is black. The new black is actually black. So Dolce & Gabbana, their window is very boring. <laughs> it's just black. <laughs> so anyway, DNG, it's not Dolce & Gabbana, it's dopamine and genes. And this is not an original joke. This is Robin Emsley's joke. And they uh, just to remind you that we know that uh, when people are psychotic, and this is a study uh, by well, Samir Johar at the Institute, uh, but you can obviously, you can uh, inject some radio labeled DOPA into, or into a, 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 an individual, and this is taken up and concentrated in the striatum. You can see it here as the red, and you can do this in normal uh, control subjects. And you can see when you take people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and are acutely ill, you get an excess of a striatal dopamine. And this goes along with a lot of evidence suggesting that, uh, that uh, one, of the, one of the final mechanisms, and not the cause, but just that the, the cause may be psychosocial, but the actual mechanism is excess dopamine causing excess salience and as a result, uh, people having strange experiences. But one of the questions has always been, what about mania? Is, uh, would mania be the same? And uh, Samir Johar and his colleagues, uh, particularly Oliver Howes, uh, have looked at this too. And so here are bipolar people who are actually manic at the time. This is a heroic study because you have to get manic people uh, and persuade them to lie in a scanner for something like three quarters of an hour, which is very difficult. Uh, and more than that, you have to persuade the people who run the scanner to allow manic people to come along and, 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 and lie in their scanner because they're worried they're going to uh, bash it about. But it took them five years to get a sufficient number of bipolar patients acutely. Well, they weren't very acutely manic because they wouldn't have been able to, 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 to lie in the scanner. But you can see that they show the same excess of uh, striatal dopamine as do people who get a diagnosis of schizophrenia. There's, there, there haven't been, as to my knowledge, there hasn't been a replication of this yet because it's such a difficult study to do. So that's, that's dopamine. I, the other thing I wanted to talk briefly about at the beginning was genetics. And you will know that, uh, that uh, for a long time, psychiatrists have thought that there was a genetic contribution to people who got a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And this was deduced from family studies, from twin studies and adoption studies. But it was all, it was all a, circumstantial and nobody could point to it was a long period of uh, geneticists coming up with uh, with with, with uh, plausible genes associated with schizophrenia which were then disproved 
uh, uh, it was said that the, the, the only the only human in, 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 endeavor no, oh, no, like my, I was going to insult geneticists here, but I, I won't do that. I, anyway, they were, they, for a long time, they were, they, they, they were, they, they were they, the studies were, came to, no, not to nothing. But in 2014, there was a very big study, a, a huge a study, whoop study, which I looked at a, a very large number of, of people with, with schizophrenia, a diagnosis of schizophrenia and controls. Now, I, I, for some reason, my screen sharing notice is over the actual number of patients, but I think it's something like 75,000 and 100,000 uh, 100, controls. And uh, I mean, I, I, the, 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 I, I'm a co-author of this, this paper, along with about another 390 uh, other colleagues. But it, we got a paper in Nature. This was the first paper I ever, or I ever had in Nature, shared with all these other people. Oh, who knows what they were doing? But they were doing the same as me, just collecting samples and send, sending them off to the geneticists who were then uh, doing genome-wide association studies. And the data was pooled in Harvard. And you can see, I think this is the, the best known slide in, in biological psychiatry. I, so it, it, the original one came out in 2014, and this is a, a, an updated version that's about to come out. And so along the bottom are the various chromosomes. Up the side is a, really the significance. And, and the red line is the, is the, uh, is the, 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 the screen for significance. So all, it's called a Manhattan plot because all these little skyscrapers are areas on, on the genome where the people who get a diagnosis of schizophrenia differ from people who don't get a diagnosis of, of, of schizophrenia. So there are at least 260 and probably lots of, of other genes which contribute. So this, when I was young, there were arguments about whether there's one big gene for schizophrenia. And if you get that, you either de develop schizotypy or you develop schizophrenia. And that, 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 that gene was a causal gene. But now we know that these are genes of tiny effect. So if you have a, a particular, a, these are the single nucleotide polymers, morphisms, these are markers. If you have, for example, the, 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 the one here, this might mean that instead of having an overall risk of 1%, you might have a risk of 1.1%, so a tiny effect. So you need a whole assortment of, a, of a susceptibility genes plus environmental factors uh, to push you towards, towards uh, a, a, a psychosis. So it, it's rather like the, uh, the genetics of height, for example, or genetics of intelligence, that there are lots and lots of contributing uh, genes, but there's a huge environmental effect as well. Oops, sorry, I'm going backwards. And one of the interesting things in this most recent version is that they've looked at the expression of these genes. They've taken these genes and then, uh, 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 and then looked to see where, the, where they're expressed. And somewhat to everybody's relief, they're expressed in the brain. So if you look at the right-hand side, it says schizophrenia 2021, you can see here is the frontal cortex, the anterior cingulate, uh, the putamen, the caudate, and so on. And then down here are our ovaries and adrenal glands and uh, heart and pancreas. And so the genes for schizophrenia, susceptibility genes, are not really expressed much in the body as a whole, which is interesting because some people persist in saying that schizophrenia is a disease of the whole body and say that the high lipids or the diabetes or the the obesity are part of a predisposition, predisposition to schizophrenia. Personally, I think they're just a side effect of the, 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 the drugs. But it's, it's a, it, obviously, if a, the genes for schizophrenia had been mainly expressed in the small intestine, then this would have a, it suggested to you there's something wrong with, the, with, with, with this kind of research. So lots of little genes. And one of the most interesting things you can do is to develop a polygenic risk score. So you take all these little uh, SNPs, 
where people with schizophrenia differ slightly from the general population. And you add them up, weighted according to their effect, and you get a polygenic risk score. And so you can estimate any individual's liability to schizophrenia. Now, it's not, it, it's not sufficiently uh, uh, powerful that you can go out into the community and, and grab people and say, you're going to develop schizophrenia. But the people who are in the top 10%, are about seven times more likely to develop schizophrenia than the people in the bottom 10%. That still just means that 7% of these people in the top 10% will, will, will develop schizophrenia. Uh, so it's, it's still quite a small, uh, a small effect. Sorry, that's my dog scratching. Uh, and <coughs> I, so one of the interesting things is that traditionally schizophrenia has been, co been, been considered a discrete category. And excuse me, I think I'll have to let the dog out. <laughs> so, I'm sorry if this, uh, uh, hey, Anna, what are you doing? Silly dog. Sorry, it's always much more interesting when this, the, something embarrassing happens to the speaker. So anyway, here is the traditional view of schizophrenia, that there are normal people and then there are people who have schizophrenia. It's like there are normal people and there are people with, who, break, who have a broken leg, or normal people, healthy people, and people with measles and so on. So this has been our traditional view that there were people who got a diagnosis of being psychotic, having schizophrenia, who were thought to have bizarre ideas, who were thought to uh, have difficulty in communicating with other people, people who couldn't uh, uh, plan for the future and behaved in a, a strange way. And these were contrasted with normal people. One of the things that we've realized recently is that normal people are really not as normal as one might have suspected. And of course, I'm not suggesting that, that Trump was psychotic, it was strange, but it's just to remind, remind us all that really that normal people often have strange behavior and bizarre beliefs. And people who get a diagnosis of schizophrenia mostly are sensible. They may just uh, have some strange beliefs about a very limited uh, area of, 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 of belief, but uh, the rest of the time they're, they're, they're absolutely sensible. So really it's not compatible, this idea of schizophrenia become, being regarded as a discrete category. So now we know that there are hundreds of susceptibility genes. This is more compatible with the idea that there's a continuum of liability to psychosis. And uh, so uh, uh, that there should be a, a normal distribution. And of course, Psychologists have been saying this for a long time, Gordon Claridge in particular, who actually taught me as a, as a medical student, I had a view like this. That, but if you look at the distribution of the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia, over on the left, there are people with a very low polygenic risk who are going to be quite hard to push into schizophrenia, people, most people in the middle. And then as you go over towards the right-hand side, you come to come to people who are more likely to have a uh, minor psychotic symptoms in the community, people who are maybe a bit paranoid about their neighbor or have uh, some strange uh, ideas that their, 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 their life is, is uh, ruled by uh, so, 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 some, or somebody down the road is somehow interfering with their thoughts, but they never come to psychiatric attention. Then you have people sort of people who would be re referred to a prodromal or at-risk clinic. And when you, uh, they, might, they might, maybe a quarter of them might develop a psychosis in the next few years. And when you screen them, you find that their polygenic risk score is, is higher again. And then there are people who get a diagnosis of psychosis, uh, but not schizophrenia, and it's higher again. And then there are people who, who uh, are higher again and who get a diagnosis of, of schizophrenia. So I mean, as I'm sure you all know, it's a favorite occupation of psychiatrists to argue over whether somebody has schizophrenia or paranoid psychosis or schizoaffective psychosis or by, well, they, anyway, but this is, it's just because it's all part of a continuum. And uh, 
it's uh, there are no there are no discrete categories. Well, there's no discrete categories in in psychiatry at all. I think. So one of the interesting things is that the genes for schizophrenia overlap. They're, they aren't discrete to schizophrenia. They overlap with, for example, bipolar disorder. Two thirds of the genes for schizophrenia overlap with, with bipolar disorder. About, say, a third with major depression and OCD. A, about a quarter with anxiety disorders. I, and right down to neuroticism, intelligence, it goes the opposite way. So, the, uh, so uh, the, the polygenic risk score for IQ, it, it tends to be low in people with schizophrenia, and we can come back to that to, uh, later. So schizophrenia, there's a lot, in, in a sense, it used to be thought people who had an anti-psychiatry view used to, to think that the genetics was the worst thing about, about the orthodox view of psychiatry, because it might label people as different. The genetics is the best friend of people with, uh, the, uh, with such a view, because it shows that schizophrenia is not a discrete disorder, and it shows that on one hand, it merges into the general population, and on the other hand, it merges into bipolar disorder, uh, and other psychiatric uh, disorders. So the reason that psychiatrists have such difficulty distinguishing between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder is because they share genetic predisposition and the propensity to synthesize excess dopamine. I give you the example of a patient who I saw with a junior psychiatrist and patient had been admitted to hospital about eight times and three times he'd had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, three times bipolar disorder and once schizoaffective disorder. And I unwisely said to the junior doctor, who of course had done the proper uh, review of the case, the case notes and everything, who were these daft psychiatrists? I thought this man's got, clearly got bipolar disorder. Uh, who were these daft psychiatrists who thought he had schizophrenia? And his mouth began twitching a little, and he said, well, Professor Murray, you were one of them. So, uh, so it's just impossible to tell sometimes whether some, it, it depends on the circumstances, whether somebody is going to present with a schizophrenic picture or a, or a bipolar picture. There's genetic and neurochemical overlap. But well, this is why people with, schizophrenia, a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, bo both categories uh, or, 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 or of diagnosis, people are given uh, antipsychotics and, and this helps them in the acute period. But there's no doubt that patients differ in their neurodevelopment. And uh, one factor is that people with schizophrenia are more likely to have had obstetric have a, a, a complications such as more likely to be born premature or to have had a period of hypoxia when they were the, when they, when when they were young I, and they, we did we did uh, what I always like to say when professors say we did a study that we really mean somebody else did it but in this case it was a lady called Mary Cannon uh, and uh, who is now a professor herself in, in, in Dublin. But uh, so she did this meta-analysis and it's recently been replicated by Fuser Poli. I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you, those of you who read the psychosis literature will know that Paolo Fuser Poli is perhaps the most productive a researcher in the world. I think he, he writes about three, three papers before breakfast every morning. But anyway, this was a meta-analysis, which essentially on a much, many more, many, many more studies, I, I really re replicated the, 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 the findings of Mary Cummins. But again, these were small effects. So if you are, if you are born premature, you're twice as likely to, to get a diagnosis of schizophrenia. It means two out of 100 instead of one out of 100 would get such a diagnosis. The uh, next question, well, I've, I've talked about how 
most of the genetics of uh, schizophrenia is through all these polygenes. But there are a small number of people who have what's called a copy number variant, where you where you lose a chunk of uh, where you either lose a chunk of of of, of DNA, uh, as in here, a deletion, or you actually get a duplication. And this is. Copy number variants account for about 10 to 15 percent of people with autism. So this is a gene which messes up your neurodevelopment. And people with learning disability and epilepsy also have are more likely to have these copy number variants. And about two to three percent of people with schizophrenia have one of these copy number variants. That's supposed to, you know, one in 10,000 or something like that in the general population. So the findings that there's an excess of copy number variants in schizophrenia reinforces the neurodevelopmental hypothesis that insults to the brain, such as being hypoxic at birth or copy number variants that mess up your brain wiring uh, are sort of developmental causes of schizophrenia. But they're, they're not responsible for anything like the majority of, of cases. These are, these are really niche causes. But say uh, this, so this is the, the again from Mary Cannon a long time ago, the, 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 the Dunedin a cohort study looking at the children who went on to develop schizophrenia. They had poorer motor development, poorer receptive language, and lower IQ. So the average IQ was about 95 instead of instead of 100. Whereas interestingly, the children who went on to develop to get a diagnosis of mania, they had better motor development and uh, a tendency to have better expressive language and to have a, a higher IQ than the general population. Now, in general, studies have, many studies have shown that bipolars don't differ in terms of their childhood IQ, but some have suggested they have an excess. So one way of actually looking at schizophrenia and bipolar disorder is to say that to, in many respects, genetically and uh, from a point of view of, uh, of, of neurochemically, they are similar. But people with schizophrenia have this additional uh, uh, cognitive developmental problem. So you might think that they're cognitively developmental bipolars. Uh, so we know that drug use can also increase the risk of, of a diagnosis of schizophrenia and psychosis. And uh, We've known this since the 1950s that abuse of amphetamines uh, can can induce this. Nowadays, we don't see that very often in in the Far East and in Australia and uh, South Africa. About a third of people who get a diagnosis of psychosis have methamphetamine psychosis. Uh, it's quite common in North America, but fortunately, we haven't seen much of it here. Perhaps person to have such uh, an episode uh, was Britney Spears, who at one point was uh, taking a lot of methamphetamine at the, at the time before she became, she became unwell. But so the, the, this is not so much a problem. It's, it, it's simple. Why, why would amphetamines induce psychosis? Well, they, they increase synaptic dopamine. But uh, sci uh, cannabis is a much greater problem for us. And the first study on this was actually in a, it was, was actually in, in India in 1893. And the British colonialists had been concerned, well, they had built a lot of mental hospitals around the big cities. And they were concerned that quite a large proportion of the people being admitted were using cannabis or ganja, I think it was called. And so they set up a, 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 a commission to look at this and uh, whether cannabis should be remain legal or become illegal. And uh, there were eight people on the uh, on the commission, four British and four Indians, with the chairman being British and having a casting vote just in case the Indians <laughs> ran away with the with the the commission. The Indian doctors tended to think. That, take, that cannabis caused psychosis. And here's a sort of quote. There, this is a, a huge, there are 10 volumes to this report. The majority of habitual consumers become permanently insane, never to be cured, but some become temporarily so and become sane on breaking off the habit. Symptoms are apt to be reintroduced on resuming the habit. 
And it was sort of accepted that this was the case. Indian doctors were pushing for cannabis to be made illegal. The British, doc uh, the British people who included two people from the tax inspector uh, and some bureaucrats, they say, think of all the money we're going to lose if you, if, uh, if you ban uh, cannabis. And they won out. And, the, and, and, and so the, the, the colonial Raj needed the money from cannabis uh, uh, to stay afloat financially. Uh, and this is very similar to some of the arguments that have been going on in North America, where governors of states have realized that cannabis can produce a lot of money in taxes. There have been three meta-analyses showing that cannabis use is a risk factor for, for psychotic disorders. And they've been put, to, put together by uh, a lady called Marconi, uh, uh, with the last author being Vangelis Vassos. And this slide shows the results of seven studies. Along the bottom are, is exposure to cannabis. So on the left-hand side is the 20% who've either not taken cannabis or relatively little. And at the other end, people who've taken the most cannabis. And the different lines are different studies. So along the bottom here, is TN from 1990. And you can see that uh, in every case, the people who've taken the most cannabis are more likely to be psychotic. Uh, but the TN study, it was a very modest effect. And that's because cannabis was quite weak in the USA in 1990, two or 3% THC. On the other hand, the red, the red line is the GAP study in South London. By this time, cannabis is about 16% THC, and you can see that the odds ratio is much higher. And uh, I, I, this, uh, you can see this is Evangelis in the pool, but the, appropriately, the pooled odds ratio is actually 3.9. I, I didn't deliberately make this joke, but somebody I gave this talk, and somebody from the audience pointed, pointed this out. I, so I think it's no doubt that cannabis is a contributing cause of, 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 of schizophrenia. Uh, it's not that people, that, that these are psychosis. It's not that people are going to develop it for genetic reasons or some other reason. And on the way there, they're more predisposed to use cannabis. Uh, does it have any effect on the incidence of psychosis? Is it big enough effect? So this is a big study that we did across Europe uh, Craig Morgan is the is is the the, the lead author in this, and we tr we tried to use all the same methods in all these different cities, sixteen cities across uh, or areas across Europe, and you can see that the incidence of psychosis is highest in London, then Amsterdam and Paris, in the northern smaller areas like Cambridgeshire or Leiden or. Clermont-Ferrand, which is a, a, a rural area in France, the incidence was much lower. And this we've known this for ages, that people who uh, are born, brought up, born and brought up in the country have lower rates. But interestingly, Southern Europe was quite different. Here's Madrid, here's say, Barcelona, the incidence 12.6 per 100,000. And here is say, Palermo, uh, 11 per 100,000. Palermo has over a million people in it and is a very poor, uh, poor, poor city. So it looks as if there is something that is protecting Southern Europe against the high rates that, uh, that, 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 that we, ha we have. Now, one factor is migration. And uh, it, 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 although the Southern Europeans now get a lot of migrants, they haven't had lots of migrants for 50 years. And so if you take out migrants and ethnic minorities, about a, th a third of this excess, it goes away. But this is plotting the frequency of cannabis use and the rate of psychosis. And so the, uh, the gray is, the, is, is data from the, the, the same uh, studies. Actually, we, we only have good enough data on cannabis in, 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 in 11 out of the, the, the 16 studies, uh, but yeah, it's, it cites rather. So you can see again, here is uh, incidence higher in London and Amsterdam and Paris. This time the, the migrants and ethnic minorities are taken out. So the incidence in London comes down to about 45 per 100,000. But again, you can see that the lowest rates are in Southern, Southern Europe. 
But here is the prevalence of daily cannabis use. And you can see that it uh, is not perfect, but the correlation is about 0.8. And it seemed to be that those places who, where cannabis use is not so rife have a much lower, particularly where use of of a high potency cannabis is not so right. Now this is nine, this is 2012, so it may have changed uh, as high potency cannabis gets into Mediterranean regions. But this, uh, that we calculated that 30% of all first episode cases of uh, psychosis in South London would not have occurred had people not been using a skunk high potency cannabis. That's not to say that they might not have been a migrant or been abused as a child, but they would have been staggering along and precipitated finally into psychosis by the, by the cannabis. Oops, excuse me. So one question is, why is the incidence of psychosis so high in South London? I, has it always been as high as that? But actually, we're lucky because we are able to look at that question because there's been a, a, red, a, 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 a Camberwell register in, 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 in South London since the 1960s. And it's possible to go back to all the notes and apply the same criteria for schizophrenia. You know that psychiatrists change their criteria from DSM to ICD to DSM 3, 4, and 5. So the, the criteria shift about. But we used the same criteria uh, right from 1965. And initially, this was done by Jane Boydell up until 1997. And recently, Diego Quattroni has gone back uh, to see what, is, what has happened subsequently. So the, 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 these are rates for schizophrenia diagnosis, not for psychosis. So they're a bit lower. They're about a third of uh, what you would get for psychosis. But you can see that in the 1960s, the incidence was about 11 going up to 14, 15. By the 80s, it was up to, uh, to about 20. But then it, it shot up to 2012. It was, it, it was three and a half times higher than it had been in the in 1960s. So one reason why the, the care of people with psychosis is so bad in inner London is because uh, there are three times as many uh, people with psychosis as the psychiatric services are funded for. Uh, and here is the, the, uh, the number of people who, in whom cannabis was thought to be a problem. And you can see this is very unusual in the 1960s and was noted to be coming to be increased and, and gradually increasing. And of course, this, this last uh, increase was when a high potency cannabis really took off and uh, went, the cannabis potency went from three, four, five percent up to about 15, 16 percent. So environmental factors that increase the risk of psychosis, we talked about one. Childhood abuse, well, you all know childhood abuse is no good for anything, but it, it increases the risk of all psychiatric disorders. Migration, we talked about. Bullying, uh, it's not uncommon to meet somebody who's in their 40s and is hearing voices, and the voices are still the voices of the boys that bullied them as a, as a, a child. Uh, being brought up in the inner city is a, 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 is a factor, and adverse life events. So I think, at least in Europe, it would now be commonplace for psychiatric researchers to, to, to think that social factors can, can be contributing causes of schizophrenia. Now, that's not, that hasn't been always the case. In fact, I think John Reed may be listening today. And I remember being at a conference probably about 2000 and I, John asking me if we had any, did, did, did I, had, did we have any data on child abuse, and I said we had a data on child abuse and, and psychosis, but we hadn't analysed it yet. And uh, and I think at that time only a minority of uh, uh, schizophreniologists or, or researchers uh, believed that uh, that child abuse in particular could be a causal factor. But now, when I say our 
our population attributable fraction for cannabis is about 30% in London. For child abuse, it's about 25%. I, so social factors can increase the risk of psychosis. But how, if we think that the final common pathway is dopamine dysregulation, can social factors cause this? So this is a very nice uh, study that uh, I'm sure uh, James knows. And this is from Ms. Rahi and colleagues in uh, Canada. And they took people, uh, three groups of people, one healthy controls, one people in the prodrome, those people who are at risk of developing psychosis, and then people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And then they gave them the Montreal stress test. Some of you may have done this. And it's quite a nasty test to do. You go in the scanner and then you, you're given arithmetic and uh, just too difficult to, to, to do it with ease. And sometimes you make mistakes. And uh, also sometimes when you get it right, a voice tells you they've got it wrong. You, know, you say three times seven is 21 and they say wrong. And then you're on to the next, the next one before you, you see you're a bit bewildered. Was that right? Was that wrong? Uh, and then a voice says, uh, remember, we're going to put all the, the results of the of the uh, study, how everybody does, on a list on the wall. And currently, you're the worst. You're doing worse than everybody else. Are you not trying? Can you not do a bit better? So this is very stressful. And you normal subjects release a little bit of dopamine. And if, if uh, with the eye of faith, you might be able to see that uh, there's a little bit of blue coloring here in, in the striatum. In the prodromes, it's greater, and then the people with a uh, diagnosis of schizophrenia, it's much, it's much greater. So this shows you that people at risk or people who get a diagnosis of schizophrenia are much more susceptible to stress, which is important. If they have no, if they come into hospital and they're discharged and we have nowhere to put them, we put them in some terrible. Uh, they, 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 we put them in some dreadful hostel in the worst part of the, the, the city, in amongst drug dealers and uh, in poverty and uh, in circumstances that most of us would find very stressful. And they are the people who have, uh, it, it, you know, if it was an ideal society, it would be people like us who were living in the bad conditions and people like schizophrenia were living in my nice house in, in, in Wimbledon. But uh, such is the way of the, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not volunteering <laughs> to immediately uh, 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 change by myself. Uh, but it, it can show you that social factors can affect dopamine. So we know that all the risk factors for uh, schizophrenia, stress, childhood abuse, migration, drug abuse, all impact on striatal dopamine. So they are the causes. The mechanism is, 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 or one of the mechanisms is striatal dopamine. Now, we know that antipsychotics block dopamine. That's what psychiatrists do all day. People with psychosis are synthesizing too much dopamine, releasing too much dopamine. It crosses the synapse and hits the receptor. And uh, the excess salience results in the psychosis and uh, what we do is to try and block the, the the receptor but of course this is not getting at the root of the problem because the root of the problem or the mechanism is the is the synthesis but this is about like taking aspirin for a headache uh, it's not it, it, it's downstream uh, and one of the beliefs of psychiatrists has been well, we can block these receptors and this reduces the psychosis, but we're now realizing that when you block the receptors, the receptors multiply. So the receptors are sort of looking around saying, where's the dopamine? There's, I, I can't get any dopamine. I, I better increase the number of uh, receptors to try and scoop up what dopamine there is. And so you get more dopamine receptors and you get what's called dopamine supersensitivity, which is fine. Well, it's not fine, but it can be managed while people are getting antipsychotics. But if they stop taking antipsychotics, especially suddenly, then you get the, the dopamine crossing the synapse and hitting these supersensitive receptors and getting an excess likelihood of psychosis. Uh, so you can think of psychosis 
uh, in relation to people as having a sensitized dopamine system. It may be uh, because they've been abused as a child, or it may be because they've been particularly stressed or because they've been abusing, abusing drugs. Uh, when they are stressed or when they are abusing drugs, you, they, they release excess dopamine. This causes abner, ab, aberrant processing of stimuli, the, uh, the, the notion of excess salience, I, and if strange things seem to be happening to you in the environment, you have to interpret them. Some people might interpret them that this is God is speaking to me, or they might interpret them in a benign way. But if you've had a difficult childhood and you've been abused, or say you're a migrant and uh, you've been brought up in a, in a, in a one-parent family, you've uh, been in poverty, you've gone to a bad school where the teachers have been against you, I, you've left school and you have uh, been had no di had difficulty in getting a job and the police have lifted you for wandering about the streets of Brixton when you weren't really doing anything. You may learn to interpret strange things as be or interpret everything as being somebody is out against me. So you may interpret this in a paranoid way and you may then develop a psychosis. Now, once you're psychotic, do you then think I. Uh, they're definitely they, these neighbors are definitely out to get me they're 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 they're, they're going to kill me or you think that uh, your parents uh, are uh, antagonistic towards you and they're damaging everything that you've ever done in your life and this the psychosis itself makes you more stressed causes more dopamine release causes more aberrant salience causes more paranoia and then i I don't know how many of you have been been on a, in, on a compulsory section of some, somewhere. Then you get a situation where the neighbours phone the police and say this man, man is is shouting at us with a hatchet, uh, and uh, we're worried that he's going to harm somebody. So out go the police, and they get a psychiatrist to go out, and somebody like me come, goes along and says. Uh, hello, Mr. Brown, and, and I'm sorry to see you in, in, in this state. Uh, you seem very upset. I think it would be a good idea if you came into, into my nice hospital. What hospital is that? The Maudsley Hospital. That place, I'm never going near there again. They tried to kill me in that place. That was an awful place. Uh, and uh, then one says, well, I'm very sorry that if... Uh, that, you're, that really, because there's going to be trouble with the neighbours, it would be better to come into the hospital. Uh, if, you, if you don't agree to come in, uh, I'll ask my friends, the police, to help you to come in. And of course, this causes a great commotion and a big fight, and uh, and people people eventually get dragged into the hospital, and where they're com confronted by a nurse and a, with a big injection to cal calm you down, Mr Brown. So all of this makes people worse. And uh, what we try and do in treatment is reduce the stress or the drug use. We try and block the dopamine, which is a sort of, uh, is not getting at the cause, but it's, uh, it, uh, it has value in, in, uh, in resolving the acute psychosis. Or we do CBT to try and uh, address the, 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 the cognitive schema. Or we do some of these new therapies like avatar therapy. So that's really the basis of the, 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 the treatment. The outcome is now much better than schizophrenia, people said. You get a diagnosis of schizophrenia, that's the end of you. Uh, at 10 years, 40% of those in our, in our study, the ESOP study, who got a diagnosis of, of schizophrenia had no psychotic symptoms for more than two years. Now, half of these people were taking antipsychotics, but half of them weren't taking antipsychotics. So 20% managed to get off, psych uh, off antipsychotics, even though their psychiatrists were telling them they couldn't do this. And uh, there have been three other studies which have come to similar conclusions. About a, a fifth of people come off antipsychotics in the face of advice that they shouldn't do this and they, they remain well. So if we were more willing to help people to come off antipsychotics, I think we might say uh, we might do better. So I'm, I'm actually going to skip this bit of a... Yeah, I, I, I think I'll actually, I'll actually stop at that, that, that point. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about, say, 
anything I've said, but also to talk about treatment because I haven't really had time to to talk about treatment. So it's really it's better. But I mean, simply, it, it's clear that uh, that uh, in the acute phase, antipsychotics are necessary. In the long term phase, a for some people will have to keep taking antipsychotics in the long term, but the British tradition has been that people are put on antipsychotics, they recover, they come up to the outpatients and they say, hey, do you think I could stop my antipsychotic now? No, no, you can't. You have to stay on antipsychotics for life. And that's the last time the psychiatrist sees the patient because they think, well, I'm not going to stay. So the, the patient throws away the antipsychotics, but they have super sensitive receptors, so they relapse. And so this convinces the psychiatrist that, of course, the illness is still active. And uh, so they, 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 so more people end up chronically taking antipsychotics than would be the case if, if psychiatrists and uh, patients negotiated uh, over the question of whether they could re reduce their medication a little bit and see how they got on and so on. And of course, this needs to be combined by, with CBT and with uh, doing one's best to to. To, to 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 reduce any any stresses. Anyway, I I will stop at that point, and I will uh, I, I will look forward to to getting your own views or arguments or uh, suggestions. Great, thank you, Robin. Wonderful talk, really really fascinating, and you covered so much ground there. Uh, just while people are put, putting their questions in the chat, I'll take my uh, chairs. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll ask you my question, which is probably what I'm getting to here. One, one is about um, uh, whether, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, whether you think smoking cannabis might be some sort of self-medication which goes wrong. And the reason I ask that is a couple of bits of evidence. One is that uh, for te uh, late adolescents who smoke cannabis, they looked at the, the, the amygdala activity when they were 14 and it was elevated. And uh, actually, so that predicted their later use of cannabis, but also some of the work you've been involved in. Is that the Imogen study? Um, I think so. I'll have to dig anyway, out. Anyway, don't worry. And then the other one is work with, that you and Marsha have done, uh, looking at odds ratios, uh, sorry, there's drilling, uh, risk for psychosis, depending on how much you smoke and what type of cannabis you smoke. And obviously we know that those with smoking daily skunk have six to seven times the greater risk. Often, on the left of those graphs are the, the infrequent hash users who they tend to see lower odds ratios like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 like relative to the, to the baseline controls indicating, I know the error bars are really big on those studies, but I, you see that a few times and I wondered whether it's a bit tongue in cheek, whether that is protective, whether there's a, that does confer less risk. Yeah. So if, uh, if we think of a uh, hash or resin, I, this is an interesting question. This is, uh, this is a question that you and I could have discussed in 2012, and we would have said that hash had low a THC. Now, interestingly, the Moroccan growers of hash have realized their market was disappearing. Skunk has now got 94% of the market, but they realized that they were losing what they, they still had. And so they, uh, they have uh, been really growing the same uh, since since Amila uh, plants, and so resin is now at least as powerful uh, 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 as skunk. But you're right that in in the old days, uh, it, they, it looked as if at least in our study we didn't get much of an increase uh, in risk with hash. No, we, excuse me, we, if, it, there was no significant difference, and it looked as if it was all it was almost a it was almost protective. And uh, of course, one has to remember that most of the epidemiological studies have actually been done on old fashioned cannabis rather than, than modern skunk. So it clearly still has some risk, but the risk is, is, is not, I mean, I was, a, I was a psychiatrist for 30 years before I ever thought to ask anybody about how much cannabis they were taking. We, when people, when relatives asked us, do you think it could have anything to do with the cannabis that they're taking? We say, no, no, cannabis is a perfectly safe drug. And it was only when we, this happened over and over and over again that we began to, to look into it. So the, but the, the question you ask, should, could people be self-medicating? Now, we have looked to see what are the reasons why our patients smoke cannabis. And the vast majority of them 
started to smoke cannabis for the same reasons as everybody else. One, because they enjoyed it. Two, because their buddies took it. Or three, increasingly, because their parents took it. Uh, and uh, the, uh, but there was a minority. There was a, a, a small minority, uh, I think maybe 15%, who said that they felt better. If they took if, if, if they took cannabis, so I I think it, it, it probably is the case that, that, that it's a bit like alcohol. The majority of people who become alcohol dependent is because they were in the rugby club or they were in the army or because they worked in a pub or they just love alcohol. But there are some people who who uh, who develop alcohol dependence because they're using the alcohol as uh, as a treatment. Uh, so that's a rather, rather long-winded answer. If it was just a genetic predisposition to schizophrenia, then cannabis use would be explained by the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia, which explains less than 1% of the variance in cannabis use. Great, thank you for that. Um, I've got a question from Paul Allen. He'd like you to uh, speak to um, future treatments. What about glutamatergic drugs? And is early intervention essential? Thank, thank you, Paul. <laughs> the, the, one, of the, uh, one of the curious things about getting old is that people ask you about the future. And I always say, this is like asking Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger is a contemporary of mine. So it's like asking Mick Jagger, what does he think about the future of grind? Or, or hip hop or some, something like that. He, he has no idea. And it's, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, it's been a great disappointment, hasn't the glutamate story? The drug companies have poured billions into into glutamate. There were a couple of uh, uh, possible possible drugs from Roche and Lilly, and they they didn't cut the mustard. Whether whether I think I suppose the problem is that glutamate is so universal that. Uh, that it's difficult to, to 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 get a drug that might impact on glutamate in the critical parts of the the network without having an effect and side effects all all across the brain. Is might cannabidiol be a useful drug? It might have a a modest effect, and and uh, 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 Phil McGuire and and uh, colleagues are doing trials on. Cannabidiol, I, I, I think we have. I mean, we've just been lucky that by accident we found that 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 D two blockade helped. But every every drug that we have present is a, is a, it has an effect on, on on dopamine. Of course, one of the problems has been people try companies try out new drugs on people who have done badly with antipsychotics. And these are people who have had a lot of antipsychotics and therefore they have dopamine supersensitivity. So you're actually giving a drug which has to deal with the schizophrenia or the psychosis and the supersensitivity. So anything that doesn't block the D2 receptors, which you've artificially made more sensitive, won't work. So I, 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 to try out new drugs, they have to be given to people who've never had antipsychotics before which is quite a difficult ethical question. So, uh, uh, Paul, I have no idea about the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Robin. Oh, there we are. Um, just a quick one, just on the, on the Manhattan plots, um, obviously schizophrenia, many different symptom clusters, you know, a lot of heterogeneity in there as well. And I wonder whether you'd looked at, um, you know, symptom subclusters. And whether they link to different aspects, different genes. Is there any anything in that? Uh, so people are trying to do that, and so, uh, for example, we we did a factor analysis. I uh, or again, Diego Quattroni did a factor analysis, and uh, they, 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 well, we didn't look at symptom clusters. Excuse me, so we looked at symptom clusters. But we still used the universal polygenic risk score, and the the the, the, the highest effect was in has been shown in a couple of studies including one of ours a, on disorganization and on negative negative symptoms whereas positive symptoms if anything seem to be less less genetic i mean an obvious 
thing to do is to, I mean, it's ridiculous to think that the genes that will make you susceptible to cannabis will be the same genes that make you susceptible to child abuse. That the cannabis susceptibility genes might be genes involved in the endo endocannabinoid system or the child abuse, the one, ones that facilitate the adverse effects of child abuse might be in, uh, in relation to the HPA axis and the, the cortisol system uh, 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 controlling the stress reactions. But people are just beginning to, to, to do that. But I think that's the way forward. Can't hear. Sorry, yes, my fault. Muted. I was just seeing if there's any more questions that are coming in. A few questions about cannabidiol, um, about improving psychosocial functioning, um, other treatments uh, to do with that. There's a question about that. One second, let me find it. One second. I about to ignore these ones. You don't like these ones. <laughs> So many to, to scroll through. Yeah, psychosocial. I mean, psychosocial treatments are obviously important. And uh, I mean, why why is psychosis so common in in inner city London? Inner city London is is a god awful place to bring up children, and it's al almost a it's almost a recipe for increasing the risk of psy psy psychosis. So uh, I'm sure there are people who, if they were brought up in Tun Tunbridge Wells in a wealthy family uh, and had good schooling and didn't have drug dealers and gangs uh, living, living down in, in the same block as them, then they, they, they wouldn't go psychotic. The question is, to what extent can one, uh, with at least with social manipulations, what, what can we do that they're relatively lim limited? What can we do in terms of psychological treatments? Well, clearly CBT is, uh, is uh, at least in my view, effective. It's been quite difficult. To, I mean, as you probably know, there are about, uh, there are about 25 different uh, meta-analysis of the role of CBT in, in psychosis. And about half of them say that CBT is wonderful. Uh, a third of them say it's useless and the others don't come to an opinion. And of course, it depends what you include. But I think the difficulty is a drug is a drug is a drug. So something like olanzapine, it's much the same drug in Los Angeles as it is here. But the quality of the CPT and the, how much people know about psychosis uh, uh, differs so widely that it's very difficult to standardize uh, cognitive behavioral treatments at the highest quality. Right, well, we're coming up to two o'clock, so I'm going to uh, draw it to a close. But just before we thank you once again, I just want to mention that we have a talk in two weeks with Professor John Reed, as was mentioned before, from the University of East London. He's going to be talking about schizophrenia again. Don't worry, crew is not just about schizophrenia, it's about everything to do with mental health, but just so <laughs> happens that we're going to talk about schizophrenia again in a couple of weeks. John, he'll be bringing this from a different perspective. So if you've enjoyed today, you'll certainly enjoy that too. Um, until then, uh, Robin, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your well, nice to see you. And I, I don't, I, I wondered if, if, if Dr. Gilvari was on the call. Uh, I thought I saw her earlier on, actually. Catherine, yes, you, oh, there she is. <laughs> nice oh, she you. recognized me. No, I, 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 I knew you, I knew you were at Roehampton, so I, I, I actually, uh, you, your picture didn't come up, but anyway, very nice to see you after these years. I know it's wonderful to hear your voice again, Robin. Anyway, wait, sorry, we should stop. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad to put that up. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Robin. I'll know that soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.